You got quiet so quickly and so nicely. Thank you. So welcome to uh, today's distinguished speaker, Linda Rendell. Uh, we are so, so fortunate to have her here, uh, CEO and now chair of Clorox uh, as of January, I believe. That's right. And so uh, Linda has had, obviously, a spectacular career, having reached, uh, reached that level of success at Clorox. Uh, she, she went to P&G coming out of college, uh, was there for a few years, and then went to Clorox and has ascended like a meteor uh, through the ranks at, uh, at Clorox. And so we're just so very happy to have you here today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to I'm going to jump right into uh, some some questions here, uh, and let's start with uh, when you when you imagine being CEO, did you think that it would be in a state of perpetual crisis? Uh, <laughs> you got the perpetual crisis right. Uh, I well, first I, I never imagined being a CEO, actually. Um, I never looked at this job and saw people who were like me for a number of years, and, and I, I thought it was a place where I wouldn't ever be allowed to be, um, to be really honest. And so it took a long time and a lot of mentors to show me that actually I could even a achieve a job like this. Um, and then, no, I had no idea it would be perpetual crisis. I had an idea, given that I knew I was transitioning and COVID had just started, um, but I didn't in imagine inflation. I didn't imagine social unrest. I didn't imagine the changing role of a CEO to the degree that it has been uh, happening. Um, but I also look at this as a very opportunistic time to make change. And so that's the reframe that I've done in my head is these are the times when people can make a real difference. And in my job, I can make a real difference making a mark on a company that needs to be ready for the crisis that comes next. So I want to come back to the, the, the crisis part of the conversation, but you brought up the, the, the really valid point that, well, you never pictured yourself as a CEO because you didn't see a lot of other women who were CEOs, and you still don't see a lot of other women who are CEOs. Um, I was just mentioning to you that, that we're now at a place where we're roughly at, at gender parity in terms of com students coming in the door, uh, but we're not close to gender parity in, in leadership roles in, in companies. So what would you tell people here? We just have to be patient that because we weren't very representative, we weren't uh, you know, very gender balanced in previous years in the top business schools. We now just need to wait for all of these people to go out and succeed. Or is there something they need to do to really help accelerate the, the ability of women to rise into the CEO position? I think patience is definitely part of it. Uh, and I think when people say this should happen now and it should be 50-50, I, I just don't think that's possible because the pool of people that are in the next level jobs and the jobs down that, we just haven't gotten to the place where we're gender parity everywhere. And that'll happen more over time, but that's not enough. So if we just wait 20 years from now, it's not gonna look very different. We need people in jobs like mine and in senior leadership jobs to reach down into organizations and ensure that people of color and women are getting opportunities and that we're eliminating bias in the decision-making in that process. And that takes conscious effort and it takes everybody being on the same page. Uh, and then I think we need people to understand what it takes to get in jobs like these and you have to be willing to make the sacrifices too. And you have to go into that eyes wide open. I have two uh, kids, one 17, one 12, they're both boys. Um, and there's a sacrifice that I've had to make um, and what the sacrifice they've had to make for me to be in this role. And I think knowing that and approaching that and knowing that your life has different chapters and meanings and just being open to what that journey is, is really important for women too. Um, and knowing that you know, it won't necessarily look like a career of a male counterpart, and that's okay. And I think having conversations about that and what a career can look like if you wanna end up in a spot like this um, and what, what that takes to balance your family is really important. And I don't think we have a lot of dialogue around that. It's either just you know, do it this way because that's the best way to get it done, but we should be having dialogue about what that means and the support that women need to get to roles like this. Were there, were there critical moments where you felt like something happened that kept you on this path, that you did have a mentor who stepped in uh, who, who, who really helped you get past a hurdle that might have 
stop someone else? I had, I had quite a few very lucky uh, to have quite a few. I had one woman, um, her name was Lene, and she was a single mother of two kids. Um, and I worked for her. She was a, a vice president at the company. And I worked for her many times, so from a very junior person at Clorox to more senior, when I eventually became her peer. And she would talk to me about the choices that she had made and struggles. And I remember when I went out on maternity leave having my oldest, and I said to her, I just don't think, how am I going to do all this? There's, there's no possible way. I already work all the time. You know, What am I going to do? And, and she just said to me, trust me, you're going to get better as a result of this. And I was like, well, that's not possible. She's like, no, you're going to learn what matters. All the stuff you do in your job today that is low value, you're going to, get, you're going to stop doing it. And you're only going to focus on what matters. And it was those types of moments with mentors that reframed things for me that got me to a place where I believed I could do it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. It didn't mean that I didn't have plenty of times when I was failing at both motherhood and being a good business person. Um, but in the end, it all ends up working out. Uh, and then much later in my career, uh, my boss at the time, who was the CEO, said, would you be interested in being a CEO? And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, who, who are you talking to? Was there someone standing behind me? And, and he said, no, I'm quite serious. Um, and we had a good conversation about, one, I was young, two, a, a woman, and didn't see many people who were like me. Um, I'm a, a fairly informal person. We might get to know each other a little better over this session, and you'll learn that. And I, I just didn't think it would be valued. And he helped paint a picture for me of what this could look like and why it might be the right person at the right time and right for a company that needed it. And I'm, it's such a gift he gave me, um, because then I started to paint my own picture of what it could be like. And you know, he, he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, you have the courage to do this. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, I think that's the key definition of, of who you are. Stop defining yourself as being a woman or a mom or, or this. He's like, you're a person with courage, and that's what this job requires. And it was, it was a really helpful moment. So those are two examples, but I have a, a long list of people I'm very grateful for. I wouldn't have gotten here without them. So the, the fact that you stepped into the CEO role uh, when, when COVID was really um, <laughs> taking, taking hold in, in such a terrible way around the world proves you, you have courage or, or maybe a lack of sense. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> so, so what's interesting about that time is that because of the products that, that Clorox uh, makes, and, and distributes, people could not get enough of your products at this time. And so you had the challenge of people were desperate to, to whether it's Clorox wipes or it's, it's charcoal briquettes so they could cook uh, outdoors. Uh, you had the problem of you're like critical to, to survival for people. And then you had to keep things going so that you get products to those people in the face of, of COVID. So how did, you, how did you keep everybody moving forward in a supply chain when it was so difficult with, with this incredible health threat? That was a, an incredible time for the company, incredible. Um, and some of it we look back on really fondly of the things we did and some things we look back and just, you know, it's hard to not get a little weepy when you think about it. The moment at home for me was I was, um, we had started you know, in the pandemic. I, hadn't, I knew I was becoming CEO at some point um, and imagining a company where I thought all the things that I was going to do, COVID hits, um, and I'm watching a video on Twitter of two people fist fighting over a can of Clorox wipes. And it was at the, that moment I'm going to get weepy um, when I realized what I actually do for a living. And it was a real profound moment. And it was when I actually fell in love with the idea of becoming the CEO for the first time. Because that's what we do. We help people. And every action that I was going to take, the team was going to take, some of which are here in the audience today, was about those people who needed us so desperately in that moment. And our, our, our brands were really lucky. We're in nine out of 10 US households. We're in over 100 countries around the world. We play a really important role. So I knew that. But it became really existential. And so the very first thing we did is said, if we want to serve those people, what do we need to do? We need to take care, care of our own people. We need to keep our own people safe. So moving people into a work from home environment. But the problem is, the vast majority of our people don't work from home. They work from plants. 
And we had people sleeping in their cars to get product. Uh, we had people who lived away from their families to do that. And so we had to make sure we took care of them first. That was the most important job. Did they have the benefits they needed? Did they have access to things? Were we getting them tested? Were we keeping them well? If somebody got sick, what did we do? Um, and I'm proud to report we had no cases of transmission in our plants during that time with the procedures that we put in place. We're cleaning companies, so we had some, you know, some insight to do that. Uh, but we just didn't know at that point. We didn't know what was going to happen to people. So job number one was keep our people well and safe so that they could do the job they could for consumers and what we needed to do. And then we had to get laser focused on what mattered. And we said things like, this is cost isn't going to be an issue. Um, and I'll tell you this caused problems later, but we said our number one job is to get as much product as fast as possible to people. That's the problem statement, not as profitably as we can. And eventually we had to make the choices to build profitability back into the business, but we, we focused on what really mattered. And that was building trust with people, getting them what they needed, um, and then knocking down any barriers we could. And, and we realized the biggest barrier to that was, was us. You know, we had a lot of processes that kept us slow, and we were proud of that. We were a company that had very steady growth. We were, you know, completely consistent and predictable. And now we had demand that was 200% above what we had expected. No, no supply chains built to do that. Um, and so we had to rewire ourselves as a company. We had to change the way we made decisions. We had to give authority to people to make decisions on their own. It couldn't just be top down all the time. Um, and so that, that was what we really got as our own house in order. Uh, and that's given us lessons that helped us over the last few years do other things too, deal with inflation. We had a cyber attack, um, had to deal with that uh, six months ago. This team in the back, I mean, I love you all. You know that, right? I mean, what you've dealt with. <laughs> Woo! Um, but I think you know, that, that was the moment we realized it was all about getting our house in order so we could serve people um, and give them what they needed. So you, you were able to do that, and you, you rallied everybody. Uh, how? How did you deal with the, the reverse issue, which is an enormous demand for your products, and then COVID starts to recede a little bit, and you didn't have quite so much demand, and so your supply chains were geared up to produce all this. And so how did you manage the, you know, the huge surge and then the ebbing away of demand post, uh, you can't really say post COVID when so many people are still getting it, but, but a new phase of COVID. Yes. You know, we uh, at the beginning had discussions about what we believed was permanent and what we thought was temporary. And, and what we said is we're going to try to plan based off of those two scenarios. And we had some of it right. We said there's no way that this, perma th this is a permanent surge in charcoal briquettes, for example. So we're not going to build, we're not going to take a bunch of money and put capital in our warehouses and facilities to manufacture because we believe this to be more temporary. But we do believe there's some permanent things in disinfecting wipes. We know that the category has been growing for a long time, so we're actually going to invest and we're going to put capital. Now, we got some of that right, not all of it, but that helped. So for the most part, we didn't build permanent capacity in our facilities. We built it temporary, that came at a cost. So every unit we produced cost more. But we knew over time we could optimize that and move that back. And at the time, people really didn't love that. Uh, the external community said, why would you do that? It's so expensive. And it turned out to be the, the most cost-effective solution over the long run, because we were able to move production back in-house. We were able to let go of the excess production that was out there. Um, and so that was the discussion that we just had, is let's place a bet on the trends. Let's see what we, we don't know a lot, but we know some. Um, and by having that discussion up front, it ended up you know, getting us to a decent place. And then we did have some issues that we got it wrong. You know, we thought, oh, this will, the mix will look like this. Um, and then we had to make choices after and course correct. But I think, you know, sitting back, and this is the lesson I would say that we've learned a lot is taking that extra second sometimes to have the dialogue and have someone debate and disagree was the most important thing that we did, was to make sure that we weren't all heading towards looking at data, being single-minded. We spent a lot of time as a team disagreeing with each other, and that got us to better outcomes. We didn't get it all right, but we certainly got a lot more right than we would have if I had just made the decisions looking at the data, or if a, a business leader for our business that makes Clorox had done that um, done on their own. So that was the big thing, is we need to operate differently as a company and debate. We're very nice culture. We're trying to move from nice to kind, uh, where, where you're, you, you know, debate is, is valued and, and expected. 
um, and world where diverse opinions matter. But that, I think, is one of the most critical things that came out of the pandemic for us is you have to create space for that. So I want to make sure I understand this distinction between nice and kind. Yes. Kind means you tell people the truth? That's right. OK. Nice just means you, know, you want to make someone feel good, I think. Um, but kind is you, know, you, you say what they need to hear, and you tell them the truth. And that doesn't always feel good. But in the end, that's the right thing to do. And we're trying to move more towards that. You know, don't just tell somebody that they did great because they want to hear it. Um, tell them what they did well, and then tell them what they didn't, and, and help them get better. OK, so this is something that, that people here should be familiar with, which is very close to the, the notion of decency, mm -hmm. where decency doesn't just be you're nice all the time. You hold people accountable. You hold yourself accountable. Yes. Um, so, so you managed through the, this COVID crisis. Um, and now you and your fellow CEOs are, are facing a period where you've got enormous uncertainty. And uh, there's been enormous economic uncertainty, kind of the, 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 the plain vanilla part of uncertainty, which has been exacerbated in, in the past couple of years. Uh, but there's some other uncertainties. There's the technology uncertainty, and in particular, the, the uncertainty around AI. Uh, there's uncertainty around uh, polarization and an election in this country and what that's going to do to your company, your country, society at large. Um, and there's the broader geopolitical uncertainty. So I want to unpack some of these in terms of uh, how, how it is that you're dealing with some of these, these risks or uncertainties. So let's start with the, the technology uncertainty. With the backdrop, I don't know if people in the room are aware of this cyber hack. And it's still, there's still an overhang on your business as you recover from this cyber attack. Can you just explain a little bit about, you probably can't tell us what happened, but, but what you've had to do in response to uh, the, this cyber attack? Sure. You know, for, for many years, we've known cyber is a, a huge threat, one of our biggest threats to businesses. And so we took it very seriously and had a set of tools and practices and systems, including updating our board. Um, but it all comes to a head when it happens to you. So on August 11th, uh, we experienced a cyber attack that caused wide scale disruption on our business. Uh, we were unable to ship product for a period of time. And then we had to move to all manual processes. So you can imagine a company that has <laughs> distribution in over 100 countries, has you know, dozens and dozens of plants all over the world, thousands of suppliers. We did it all manually on Excel spreadsheets for a period of time. Uh, and we were in the middle to, or I should say the beginning, of our technology transformation. We were investing for our company, it was about $7 billion in sales, a half a billion dollars in uh, our technology transformation. So putting a new ERP in place, for those of you who are all familiar with that, and a set of digital tools to run our business, really changing the way everyone at Clorox works. Um, and so much of that had not been in place yet. So we had cyber tools, but we didn't have that. So we are trying to operate our business manually. Um, and ensure that we get consumers the product they need. And we didn't. We, we ended up having significant out of stocks. Um, and our team's job was to keep the company safe and secure and do as much as we could as fast as we could. The good news is in the last quarter, we recovered most of our distribution and able to go back to you know, automated um, order processing. But it was a huge impact. And the reality is that is one of the risks that everyone is facing now, personally. So have your own good cyber practices, please. <laughs> um, don't use the password and put it on your computer, small things like that. Um, and then big cybersecurity as well. But this is a huge threat for, for businesses. And these people are getting more sophisticated. They're using different methodologies. Um, and, and there's different ways that they can attack companies. And the, the reality is no one can protect themselves 100%. But you have to be able to, when that happens to you, be able to respond as quick as you can. And that's what we're focused on now is making sure that inevitably, when somebody comes knocking again, uh, that we're prepared for that and, and that we've made the, the, the investments that we need to, um, as we did in the past, to, to be as safe and secure as we possibly can. So that's all backdrop to the, the question I want to ask now, which is, as we, as we are in this era of people trying to take advantage of generative AI, uh, does this experience make you nervous about more, more control given to AI and less control given to HI or human intelligence? 
um, because I know that you're, you, you are actively involved with efforts to use generative AI. No, I, I do think there are more threats that come from that, but I also think there's more opportunity to stop the bad guys. <laughs> So if used properly, and I have lots of confidence that there are people out there that are going to use this technology for good to make us actually more safe and secure. I'm actually incredibly excited about Gen AI. I mean, we use AI on our business today, and we're dabbling in Gen AI on, on some use cases. But the fact that we could take more human beings doing higher value work is an amazing opportunity for growth. Um, for efficiency, and so we're looking at it as is just like we did when we outfitted people with computers 20 years ago. This is a gift, and if we use it right, this is going to create the next set of innovation for people that it's going to delight them. It'll allow us to do things at a lower cost. Um, so I'm really excited about it. Now we've taken lessons to how we do that, and we do it safe and securely. Uh, but I am definitely more on the excited side than the nervous side. Okay. So next, next risk, uh, the, the, the threat of polarization in society. So uh, what's been happening is that a number of things that companies have been really engaged with that they think are core to their business and core to making society better uh, are under political attack. So I'm referring to things like ESG, DEI. Uh, and, and so what's happened uh, for many companies is that they've stopped using those letters. They, they don't talk about ESG. They just do whatever they were going to do. They don't talk about it. They don't talk about DEI, but they still do those things. Uh, you're different. So I notice in your annual report that, that you, you talk about Ignite, uh, which actually, if you read the text, then is all about integrating ESG principles into your fundamental business model. Uh, you talk about IDEA, uh, which when you unpack what IDEA stands for, it's uh, you, you fancily change the order of some we of those did. things to inclusion, <laughs> diversity, equity, allyship. Um, but this is all over your annual report. You, you are not backing away. Tell me Tell me how that's working. Are you, uh, are you fine with that? Or are you, are you getting people who say, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you, why are you missing out on profitability and focusing on, on this alphabet soup stuff? Well, I think it comes down to the core of who we are at Clorox. And our number one principle, our number one value is do the right thing, without question. And to do the right thing is to look the facts in the face and deal with them. And the facts are that we have climate change that we need to deal with. The facts are that we inclusion delivers better business results. And those are the facts. <laughs> They're the facts. And so we will deal with the facts. And we will put out there a business strategy that includes all of those facts. And so it would be ignorant on our part to suddenly decide that those things are no longer important to our business because they're some of the biggest risks we face over the long term. And they're some of the biggest opportunities that we can capitalize on if we do it well. And so that's, that's the conversation that we have. Now, we have no interest in this being, I don't view any of these topics as political. I view them as just necessary to delivering good business. Um, and I know they've been politicized and I'm, I'm sad about that. But for us, it's core to how we, we uh, manage our business. And like you said, it's integrated. It's not a hobby off to the side. Our general managers are accountable for our sustainability plans. They are accountable for delivering that just like they are their innovation plans, their cost savings plans, their growth targets, their profitability targets. They are accountable for that. Um, and we are also accountable throughout the organization in delivering a workplace that is diverse and where people feel they can do their best work. And so, we're, of course, we're going to say it, because that's how we believe we create value. And, I, and I'll tell you, if, if people aren't hearing from us one of the biggest risks is climate change to our business, then, then our investors would say, shame on you. Um, and we have lots of conversations with our investors and how important this is that we ensure that we have raw materials and uh, that we have sustainable ways of producing things, and that we produce things that are more sustainable that consumers can use, because we produce consumable goods, right, that people ultimately take a package and, and have to dispose of. And, and so I just look at it as business critical. And if it's business critical and it's do the right thing, then it's, it's going to be right out there on the annual report. So you, in, in this annual report, you, you talk about the traditional financial metrics and so on. But you also talk about other metrics in, in terms of you know, hitting uh, 
uh, hitting targets with respect to landfill usage, with respect to uh, kind of climate aspirations uh, with your carbon footprint and, and, and so on and so forth. And in fact, uh, I think you were ranked number one by Barron's as the most sustainable company. You were. Um, and so, so there seems to be lots of evidence that, that you're very successful there. Um, if you look from a pure financial point of view at your stock price, are you getting pressure to say, hey, you may be number one on sustainability, but you're not number one in terms of your, your returns? You know, so we, we aspire to deliver top third uh, total shareholder return and do it in a way that integrates ESG. And I, and I think that's the sustainable business model that actually gets you to top third TSR over time. That doesn't mean individually every decision we make is going to be profit accretive to you know, change a plastic to something that's PCR based or to have a recycling program in business. Not every individual business choice we make is going to be profit positive, but in aggregate, the most value creation we can deliver is by putting those things together over time. And, and our investors are with us not for, we don't tend to have a lot of short holdings. We tend to have a lot of long shareholders who care equally about these things. And so that's the conversation we have with them is over the long run, we believe the way that we deliver top tertile TSR is by integrating these things together. And they believe the same thing and that's why they invest in our company. Um, but I think anytime anyone wants to look at something a quarter or a year or whatever, that's just a false way of looking at the overall value creation and the potential of a company. Um, and, and that's why our shareholders like us is because we're taking a longer view there and, and we're not afraid to make some choices in the short term that we believe are positive for value creation over the long term. And we're citizens of the world too. Um, and so those are all the other metrics that matter and those things have to come together. We have to have communities that are healthy. We have to have people that are thriving. Uh, and I think ultimately that's the way that businesses create value over time is by having communities that then, you know, want to buy your products and have good jobs and all of those things. So it, it, fills, a, it fills a cycle and I think, you know, I, you can tell I feel pretty passionately about it and our team feels passionately about it as well. So um, it, it, it's, uh, it's clear that you're, you're very passionate about this, but you said something very interesting, which is there's, there's short-run performance and there's long-run performance. And so many of the things that you're talking about from this integrated point of view really are long-run investments. It's a long-run investment in making sure you have the talent that, that will make you successful. It's long-run investments in your communities. It's long-run investments in the right kinds of products. And, and it's long-run investments that take away some of the risks that we face if we don't take care of our, our planet. Um, how, how, do you, how can you advise people in this room to get your stakeholders to take that same long run point of view? Because there's a lot of short run pressure on CEOs to deliver those quarterly results. So how do you, how do you manage to stay firm in the face of that kind of environment? I think you have to, you have to be clear on and have the, the, the backing and the thesis of how you are gonna create value. And if people see what that adds up to, and they understand the choices that you're making and, and how they result in better value creation over time, people generally wanna listen. It's when you don't have that thesis, when you aren't clear on how that all adds up that then every single quarter is gonna matter. Now let me be clear, every quarter matters at Clorox. We wanna deliver what we commit to but it's in service of those longer term objectives. We wanna be a profitable, faster growing company. And the choices we're making are all adding up to doing that. Now that still means in a quarter, we're gonna set aggressive goals and we're gonna go after them. And the other thing I would say it doesn't release you from is what you can never say ever is, well, that's just a long term thing. So I'm gonna pay whatever I want to right now and I'm not gonna hold my team accountable to anything in the short term. What we say is we want to, we would love a triple win. We'd love something that where the consumer loves it better, where it's cheaper to produce and it's more sustainable. Now we don't always get there, but that's what we strive for in every single thing that we do. And that puts tension in the system. It puts a box around things so that innovation happens and that we solve problems, not just by throwing money at it, but by coming up with new ideas and new technologies. And so I, I think that's the other thing I would say is, you know, this is not in service of just, hey, the short term is what it is. No, we still put a lot of pressure on that short term, but we just always have the eye to what that means in the long term. And if we have to make a trade-off, we do it because we have good logic and, 
and we've been you know, clear about what we think the consequences are. So back to something I said before, the, you have a number of companies or CEOs who are, who are ducking, uh, ducking ESG, ducking DEI, um, and you're front and center. I mean, it, you're saying this is integrated into our business model. It's completely transparent in, in everything that you do. Would you say that, that you're being kind and they're being nice? Hmm. Um, I'm going to say that this, I'm going to be generous, I think. I think this role is really hard. And I think it's hard without being stuck in the middle of a political discussion. And most of us just want to do good for the people that we serve. If we sell a product or good or service, if we have people all around the world who work for us, we, we want all of those things to add up to good outcomes. And so I think generally people are doing that because they want to be focused on those things and they don't want to be distracted. I, I don't think it's really the nice or kind thing. I think it's more people are saying, is it, worth, is it worth it for me to even engage in this battle? Can't I do good without even having to engage in that, in that dialogue and I'm wasting energy when I could be spending my energy solving the problems? Now, I think we can do both. Um, but I, I generally see my peers, it, it's not from a lack of wanting to stand up or saying anything. They just, when it comes down to it, if they're going to spend an hour of effort, they're going to spend an hour of effort solving something. And I really do believe that the vast majority of CEOs, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, they haven't left up, let up on their commitments. And, and so I, I paint it a little bit more positively than that. Okay, good, good. <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask another question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience to ask your questions. Uh, so as you, as you reflect on your very successful career, so this may be a hard question to answer, uh, but as you, as you take your current self, giving your 20-year-ago self advice, what, what would you tell yourself? I mean, this is kind of relevant to the people in the room. You know, what, what can you say? I wish I had known, I wish I had done, I wish I would thought of that uh, earlier in my career so that I could have had less, less pain, less friction, uh, and uh, obviously not less success because you've had so much success. There's a heck of a lot. Um, I think the biggest thing would be that the failures would be the most important part of the journey, by far, by far. And I remember failing early in my career or failing as a kid. I was an athlete, I played volleyball, losing a game, and just feeling like I was less of a person for that. You know, I hated losing. I, by the way, I still hate losing. Like, I hate it. <laughs> but now I accept it as part of what I have to do to be better. And I'll tell you, the worst managers I ever had are the people that put me in the seat because I learned from them what not to do. And although I'm very grateful for the good ones, it really was the bad ones that I learned from the most. The times when I utterly fell flat on my face are the times that I've learned the most from. And it didn't feel like that. It doesn't feel intuitive. And you probably hate people say that to you all the time. But it is so true. If you let yourself take risks, and if you let yourself have the possibility to fail, you'll do amazing things. And that was the own question I asked myself when someone said, do you want to be a CEO? And I said, no. And I realized the reason I said no was because I was really afraid to fail. And then when I just looked at myself in the eye and said, well, what if I did? And then I turned to my husband, I'm like, are you going to love me any less? And he made a joke and said, yes, which was not helpful at the time. And then quickly said, of course not. And I said, well, my kids love me less. Will I be any less of a person? Am I any less? And, and the answer, of course, was no. Um, but would I sit back? 30 years from now and kick myself for not taking the opportunity? Absolutely. Um, and maybe could I do some good along the way and make it better for other people? I think I could. So I would just advise you, it, it feels, again, like just everyone says it, but it really is the time when you fail that you learn the most, when you're in the hardest places of your life that you learn the most, if you just open your mind and ears and senses to what's going on around you and accept it. Um, and do not hide yourself from it. Run towards it. Give yourself more opportunities early in your career to do that, because then you build all those muscles to do it later. Because um, you can't do this job without having failed a whole lot, because you're going to fail. And I fail every day in things. And, and I'm getting better as a result of just being open for it and, and listening and being curious about why. So I lied. I'm going to have to ask another question okay. as a follow-up. Um, so 
it, it's one thing to say if you can really learn from failure, but how did you teach yourself to, instead of getting obsessed with, oh, I can't believe I did that, to, to put yourself in a position where maybe you don't embrace it, but you, but you accept it and you, and you really learn from it. What, what advice do you have in terms of how you can change that mindset to a more positive mindset? I, I had somebody who, a uh, coach, who uh, did one thing after every time we lost a game. Um, he would say, why? And we would just, with curiosity, examine why. And it was a moment for learning and reflection. So I try, in all of these moments, to just be curious and ask why, and then learn. And that's really the lesson I've taken. So that didn't work, why? And if you can just sit in curiosity and examine it, almost like, like a third party and not take it too personal, then you, you, can, you learn. As soon as you shut that off and you say, I'm, I, you know, I, don't, I don't want to examine that, it's hurtful, it's painful, it's when you don't actually get the lessons. And failing actually will just lead to more failure because you'll never learn. Um, so I would say curiosity and then your favorite question, I hope, would be why? And then why again? And why again? OK. So questions from the audience. There are microphones in the back there on the railing. Don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> can you, can you go to a microphone? Islanda, thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Mary, and first, before I ask this question, I'll caveat it by saying I recognize that if there was a male sitting in your position, he wouldn't be asked this question. So That's okay. In some ways, thank you for saying it, but it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I am still early in my career, but I've been told already by many people that if I want to be a CEO, I can't be a great mom. So I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the ebbs and flows, or what it has looked like for you to maybe not succeed in every moment at every time, but be able to kind of weather the storm. I'm sorry people are telling you that. Uh, it's not true, but it's hard. Um, first of all, I don't think being a CEO is right for every, everyone. Um, and I don't think it's right for every mom or every dad or any person who doesn't have children. You know? And so one, you have to examine, do you really want it? Because it comes with sacrifices. And what I would say is uh, that old thing that you can have it all, please let it go. You can have a lot over the course of a lifetime, but you can never have it all at once. And so letting go of that and just saying, at this moment, this is what I'm going to let into my life, and this is what I'm going to put away from my life, matters. And I will tell you, I think, I hope, we'll see how it proves out, they're only 17 and 12, I think I'm raising men who will respect women and other people, and who look at their mom as somebody who is first and foremost their mom to them, but also doing things in the world that you know, they admire. And so there are trade-offs. Have I been at every one of my kids' school events? No. In fact, I've had a lot of torture by moms who have made comments over the years. And I have to put those in a box and not listen to those things. So you've got to turn the voices off. Um, but you have to define what matters to you, and then you cannot let anyone else define for you what that is. And if you want to be a CEO someday, and that's important to you, that's important to you. And don't let anyone else tell you it's not. When someone says, well, if you're not at Johnny's whatever, then you're a bad mom, that's not true. That's their own definition of that. And you have to be able to block it all out and define what's right for you and your family. You can do it. You cannot do it all at once. Make the trade-offs go in eyes wide open. And, and I was actually saying to Bill on the walkover, the, the principle I live my life by is there are very few one-way doors in life. And actually, Amazon talks a lot about this in decision making. There are a lot of two-way doors. You make a decision, and you can reverse it. Now, having a child is a one-way door. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Choosing to, I want to aspire to be a CEO is always a two-way door until you get to the job and then you kind of have a little bit of a one-way door for a while because you owe something to the company and you got to do the right thing. Um, 
but never confuse one-way and two-way doors. And you can always make a different decision if it's not working for your family, then walk out the door. Do something different. Put it on hold for a while. Um, and I would just encourage you to do that. And that's when I took this job, knowing the strain it would put on my family, I said to myself, this is a two-way door. It's not a two-way door right away, but if this is not working, I will make a different choice. Um, my husband made a sacrifice. He went part-time in order for me to do this, which I'm very grateful for. And he, that man spends more time driving children around in cars than he would like, uh, but he's amazing for doing it. So you can. Don't listen to anyone else. Listen to yourself. And then find other people who can help you who've done it and we can give you the, the real advice. And you know, don't be afraid to cry alone in the bathtub sometimes at night, because it happens. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Oh, yes, here first. Yeah. So thank you so much for spending time with us. My name is Ryan, and you may be aware, maybe Bill <laughs> mentioned it, that this Duke is really known as one of the premier sustainability and sort of climate and energy and environment focused schools. And we talk a lot about CPG products in the context of sustainability. I was curious in reading your sustainability report, what do you think is the next big challenge for Clorox? I know that, for example, there are still unmet goals on virgin plastic inclusion in many of the products. What do you see as that next hill that your team is trying to climb from the targets that you've already set and achieved into those that you are you know, striving towards. Waste, Thank you. plastic waste is, uh, is the one that is the highest on mind. Now we have you know, made a commitment to net zero, uh, et cetera, but dealing with plastic waste and having materials that allow us to package our goods in a way that's sustainable is the thing that we're most focused on. And so of course, in making things recyclable, reusable, compostable. You know, we've set a goal there. But having access to good quality PCR, um, having access to new materials that allow us to deal with things, recyclability of things like films. Um, you know, we don't have infrastructure in this country or around the world to deal with a lot of these things. And so that, in, that, that encompasses a lot of subtopics, but really waste and plastic waste are the things that we're, that we're most focused on and have the most um, impact on our business. Evening, thanks for your time. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, by the way. Women have tons of superpowers, and shout out to all moms. It's a huge, huge, huge uh, just responsibility and giving, giving upgrading to people who are from this country and not other country. Women are a big thing in my culture, so uh, shout out to them. Uh, I, I had a question earlier you were talking about in time of distress, you were giving autonomy to like lower level managers and how that sort of like navigated the time COVID and a new phase of COVID. Just what's the biggest challenge as it relates to in that time? You mentioned distribution centers were getting like blocked up and things were stuck out. How, how do you n navigate not just your role as a global leader, but the people below you and how they navigate those challenges with business abroad? You know, um, this is one that I thought would be easier. You know, push decision making down to the best level or the people have the most knowledge to make it. And, and that's gonna be super easy, right? Because those people have the knowledge and they're gonna to wanna to make the decisions. And then, and, and also to your point in our broader network, let people make decisions outside of our company and our supply chain to help us make that once we set the goal straight. It's really hard. Um, and, and then the few barriers that we found is one, when you have experience and so you're a senior leader, you've seen a lot of things. So it's very easy to make decisions. Um, and I will tell you, there are times we have taken decision-making back up. So when that cyber event happened, we had a very small group of leaders making centralized decisions. Um, and that because we had the experience, the speed, and we could see the breadth of the, the challenge we were dealing with, and the individual groups could not see that. And so we took decision-making back up. But pushing decision-making down um, requires accountability on both sides. And that's what we're trying to ingrain. And, and I'll tell you, we've, we've made progress, but we're not all the way there yet. People have to be willing to accept that accountability. And you have to be willing to hold people accountable and hold yourself accountable to allowing that to happen. So we, we've done things structurally in our operating model. We've done things on decision rights, et cetera. But I think the thing that we will do the most amount of work on and the job is not done is culture. And, and really thinking about the culture end to end and the impacts of all the things that we do, that whole ecosystem, how we pay and reward people, how we set goals, you know, the things that we throw up in, in town halls, the words that we use, um, the functions that we hold, all of this stuff, that's what we, you know, as a leadership team, we're thinking about what signals are we sending to the companies that are counter to the model that we've put in place. And we realize we do it all the time because we're used to doing it, et cetera. 
So we, we're talking a lot about right now, how do we create a culture where people feel empowered and able to make decisions rather than us saying to them, you are the decision maker, go make the decision. That is, very, that is not as effective as, as having a culture where that is valued and, and respected and that everybody understands they'll be held accountable to that and, and are willing to accept that accountability. I'm interested in learning more about like how do you discern good managers from bad managers and then like attached to that you put together, you've talked or mentioned your team and like is there any specific questions that you ask to identify the people that you want to be surrounded with? Yeah, great question. Um, so good managers from bad managers. Uh, there, there are two buckets of things that we talk about. Um, for a long time when, when companies evaluated results they focused on the what. So what did a person deliver? Did they deliver the outputs and outcomes that they were expected to? Did they grow profit? Did they grow sales? Did they reduce costs? Did they do it quickly? And a number of years ago, well before I was in the seat, our company really went to the what and the how. So did you deliver the outcomes and how did you deliver those outcomes? And to me, if those things aren't equally weighted, it doesn't matter. So we've had people who are terrifically successful at driving outcomes and they absolutely destroy the talent that they work with. And that is unacceptable. And then we have people who only focus on people and aren't getting to the outcomes and that's unacceptable either. So we spend a lot of time talking about it's the what and the how. So for, as a manager, I expect the what and the how. You can't be a manager without having both of them. It doesn't matter how talented you are. Um, and so we, we spend time talking about that and observing that and then also making sure we don't have bias in that because people do things differently, you know, and, and one person's way of leading or, or coaching somebody can be different, but if they are effective in doing that, you know, that is actually a, a beautiful thing for a company to have is in diversity of the way that a, a person leads and manages. Um, I would say also a manager is somebody who views their job as being in service of. And as soon as it becomes about we and them and not me, then you really see the magic of what a, a manager and a leader can do when they realize what purpose they're driving towards and that they're there to help people do that. So those are the things that I look for. And then the people I want to be surrounded by, I want to be surrounded by people who share the companies and my values without exception. Uh, if there's anyone on the team who doesn't want to do the right thing, they can absolutely find the door as quickly as possible or we will help them find the door. Um, that's a, just, you know, the base level of playing. Um, I like to be around people who want to get better and want to make me better and want to make the world around them better. And so I tend to be attracted and, and hire people who, when I meet them and they tell me stories, it is all about making that progress and that they're not afraid to look at themselves with a mirror and, 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 and make themselves better as well. Um, I like to be surrounded by people who want to win. And not because of just it's winning, but because that I believe winning means that you're, you're bettering what, what you're touching. Uh, so I tend to look for those qualities. Um, and then I'm trying to evolve the qualities that I am looking for in helping the team. Like I'm a workaholic. I tend to be surrounded by a lot of workaholics. We're trying to better balance, things like that. So as a team, we're growing and looking for other attributes of people who help us live more balanced lives. Um, and we try to talk about that a lot more, but those are things that I used to look for, somebody who was like a 24 seven person and, and that's not the quality I wanna look for anymore. I like people who work hard, but I also, I wanna look and, and ensure that we have people who are well-rounded and you know, who are willing to get the job done, but also you know, that, that's not the only way that you can be successful in a job is, uh, is being somebody who wants to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I hope that helps. Hi, Linda, my name is Sean. Thanks again for being here. Um, you mentioned having the courage to do the job as a CEO, but I, I imagine that's a little different than having the courage to raise your hand to be considered for the job and then wait through the process to finally be announced as the new CEO. So how did you manage that part of the process and the emotions and the nerve wracking moments that went with, I'd like to be considered to being unleashed to the public as the new CEO of Clorox? Yeah. Um, I was pretty darn sure I wasn't gonna get the job. Uh, and that was based on a few factors. One, um, I hadn't been a senior executive for that long, you know, number of years, but a lot of people who become CEOs, you hear stories of they were the president of the company for 10 years, and you know, I wasn't. Um, 
I am relatively young for a CEO. Uh, and I also had a different vision for the company. And I, I wasn't sure the board was going to get on the same page, uh, because I think they were very happy with the way things were going. And, and so again, I asked myself, well, OK, so if I go for it and I don't get it, what happens? Well, pretty likely I'm going to leave. OK, that's OK. Um, I love this company, but I'm sure I can love it someplace else too. Uh, and so I asked myself all those what if questions. And then the most important was, well, what if I don't go for it? And all of the answers to that question <laughs> were way worse than if I went for it and didn't get it. And, and so that's, you know, I kind of ask myself that in every decision. What's the best that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? I told my 17-year-old the other day, he had to have a hard conversation with somebody. I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? And he came up with this long list. Well, this could happen and this could happen. I said, well, what's the worst that could happen if you don't say anything? And he was like, well, that, and then he started listing things that were a lot worse. What's the best that could happen if you do this, right? And so that's what I, I based the decision on. I knew that I might very well be leaving a company I loved and people I loved, and, and I decided that was OK. Uh, and I think in anything that you're doing, if you're pursuing a job or you're going for an interview, ask yourself the question, what is the worst that could happen if I go for this? What's the worst that happens if I don't? And what's the best that could happen? And, and usually, that usually leads you to having courage and taking a risk. Uh, thank you for being here. Just <clears throat> quick question about the cultural change that you referenced earlier. From your vantage point, I'm, I'm curious both how you manage that change um, and also how you measure that change to make sure that it's not just something that you talk about, but also something that is really taken into effect at the company. I think it's the hardest thing that we do because um, culture is a culmination of everything that you do in an organization. and. And so we're, I would say we're only partway through this journey. One is not being afraid to look at the truth of what it is. So we do, for example, uh, teammate engagement surveys. So we're always asking people, what do you think? <laughs> you know, do you think this is working well? And what comes back is super painful sometimes. You're too slow. You're this, you're that, I don't like that, and it's like, we spent years of rejecting, well, but they only mean this because we were going through this bad thing or we had a bad year. And, and instead, now it's like just sitting in it and saying, that's the truth from the people who work for us, for us, right? And so what do we want to do about it? So the one thing is like living in reality and culture and really seeing the culture for what it is and what it's not, I think is super important. And, and don't tell yourself stories about that. And then how you track it, one, we track it through talking to our people and hearing from them are the things that we're doing improving in your mind. Um, and, and we track that. We do kind of quarterly pulse surveys, and then we do annual big surveys to see that. So live from the people where the culture is in live, what do they tell you? Not just do I feel good about the culture, but do they feel good about it? And then I believe good culture drives better outcomes. So what you would see is in the key outcomes for our business, you should see an uh, improvement culture move those outcomes. So we should grow faster. We should have more engaged consumers. Um, we should innovate better, et cetera. So I think it's a network of things that you're looking at, but I think looking at the problem for what it is um, and then hearing from the people who are part of the culture is the most important part. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, hopefully it's an interesting one. Uh, my name's Cade, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming today. Um, so let's say I graduate, I'm not, I'm graduating in two years, but say I were to graduate this summer, I get a little sign-on bonus at the beginning of my new job. Why should I take that money and invest into Clorox stock for the next three years? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, for, hopefully some of what I said today mattered, um, <laughs> I hope. You know, I think we're, um, here's what makes, I think, us special. We are not fancy. We are not going to invent the next rocket ship, and we're not going to be the leaders in Gen AI. And, you know, we're, we make things that make your life better every single day. We keep your family well. We keep your family healthy. We ensure that if you have chap lips, that we're going to take care of those. By the way, we have some lip balm for everybody. Um, look at that right back there. Um, and I think that that need for people, what makes their everyday life a little bit better, is something that will always be relevant to people. 
we do the little things that make your life better. I hope when you go home, you open up your cabinets and see that you have a Clorox product in there. We make a lot of brands. Nine out of 10 of you should, based off of uh, the math that we have. And so I think we, we serve a real role for people. Um, and we are committed to making that role in people's lives better every day. And we live that purpose through what matters to the people out there. And so I think why you would invest in us is because we have a business model that is focused on people, on consumers, and we relentlessly focus on that experience for them. And we're really pretty, pretty, pretty darn good at making money doing that. We do all of the things in concert to think about that. Um, and we're going to be around for a long time because we're going to do it in a sustainable way. We're going to do it in a way that empowers people and brings the best talent in and, and gets the very best out of them. And so 20 years from now, we'll be able to tell the same story. OK, well, that's, uh, that's a great way to stop. Um, I'd just like to repeat my thanks for having you here today and, uh, and really showing our students and, and our, our broader community what what it means to be a great leader. Um, in, our, uh, in our world, our highest accolade is leader of consequence. And so thank you for showing everyone here what it means to truly be a leader of consequence. And I'm so sad to say you must have had some really terrible bosses because you've learned so much. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me.